excited to to uh, be here. Of course, I uh, would have loved to uh, see all of you all in person uh, and and visit Goddard in person. Uh, but hopefully, I can then do that in 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 the in the coming weeks and, and months uh, sometime. But uh, in in the meantime, I'm delighted to then talk to you uh, uh, virtually uh, some of, uh, about my research. Uh, then on uh, uh, then which in broad strokes focuses on yeah the de um, uh, developing and using uh, new technologies to better characterize and uh, detect uh, exoplanets, particularly around uh, MDORS. So then, yeah, let's just uh, dive uh, right in. Um, so at the beginning of the um, uh, talk, um, oh, one thing that uh, I wanted to mention: if you have any, if you have any uh, questions during the talk, don't hesitate to just unmute yourself and and uh, then ask. I think that's the the best way to do things over Zoom. So. Yeah, then let's just dive right in. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, I, I wanted to just sort of take uh, uh, the lay of the land of the current uh, status of uh, exoplanet uh, detections uh, to date. And in this plot, then I'm showing uh, the current best estimate that we have of the mass of a planet as a function of uh, orbital separation, where I've highlighted in the different colors uh, over here the, the, the different tech detection techniques. In um, what jumps out right away is the inherent different sensitivities that the uh, different detection techniques have. Direct imaging is more sensitive to planets that are further out on the, the transit and the radio velocity method are more sensitive to planets that are closer in. Another thing that jumps out right away is, is this part of the plot over here where true earth analogs live. Uh, and this is then where uh, then true Earth analogs lives, and this is uh, then particularly sparsely uh, populated. Uh, now, and that's the primary reason uh, for that being is that these are relatively hard uh, signals uh, to detect. But we live at uh, in at exciting times when we're starting to become better and better at uh, detecting these uh, exciting uh, new worlds. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'll primarily uh, discuss the transit and the radio velocity methods. Those are the two uh, main methods that I use in, in my research. And uh, because I'm sure that all of you are all uh, very familiar with these, then just very briefly, uh, the transit method then relies on measuring the minuscule dip in flux as a, a planet crosses in front of the stellar disk. And this gives us a wealth of information about the planet and in particular about the radius of the planet. And um, uh, with respect to the Doppler radio velocities that I'm showing over here in red, uh, this then the, relies around uh, the fact to try and measure the minuscule uh, wobble uh, of a star due to an orbiting planet. And this is uh, one of the most effective ways that we have to measure exoplanet masses. And to calibrate everyone on the precisions involved when trying to make these measurements, then the transit depth of Earth around the sun is on the order of 80 parts per million. And the radio velocity amplitude of uh, the sun due to the Earth is on the order of 10 centimeters uh, per second. And with respect to the uh, photometric precisions, these sort of precisions we have uh, been able to uh, obtain from space with precision photometers, such as from Kepler. And uh, it's only, only relatively recently that we were able to uh, obtain these sort of uh, uh, photometric precisions from the ground, like I'll talk about in, in the coming slides. And with respect to the radio velocities, uh, then over the last decade or so, we've been sort of stuck at the so-called one meter per second radio velocity uh, barrier. And, but in just the last couple of years or so, uh, we've seen uh, some very exciting new instruments uh, coming online uh, that are uh, starting to show a radio velocity precisions on the order of 40 or 50 centimeters per second. So we, uh, that is super exciting uh, because we're sort of really then sort of paving the way uh, towards this exciting RV precision goal of around 10 centimeters per second, which is then the precision we really need to be able to uh, detect true earth analogs. But in the meantime, as we uh, then try to understand uh, more about the properties of, of these terrestrial planets, we often then uh, turn our attention to uh, then studying planets around M dwarfs. Uh, but M dwarfs have a number of different uh, properties that make them favorable for, for studying planets, and in particular, uh, then uh, small uh, planets. Number one, uh, M dwarfs uh, are numerous. Uh, M dwarf uh, stars are actually the most uh, types uh, or numerous types of star in the galaxy. Three out of every four stars uh, in the Milky Way are uh, then M dwarfs. And in this context, I, I really like showing this a quick uh, uh, video clip of. Um, of just a nominal uh, uh, then patch of uh, sky uh, showing here what it looks like in the visible. But because uh, M dwarfs are uh, relatively faint in the optical, we uh, really can't see them so well unless we actually start to observe them at redder wavelengths at, in the red optical or in the near infrared. And then if we take a look at uh, what um, this same field looks like in the near infrared, it is just sort of like 
uh, blows up with uh, with a number of 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 of, of M dwarfs in 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 the field. Um, so M dwarfs are pretty particularly great because there are just so many of them uh, that uh, are then ripe uh, for the picking to find uh, more uh, uh, than planets around them, and they have remained particularly poorly studied uh, until relatively recently due to the fact that they are just so intrinsically faint in the optical where the the current highest most precision uh, facility facilities uh, have been operating. And um, another great reason why uh, M dwarfs are uh, great targets to, to study uh, uh, then small planets, and especially with respect to habitability studies, is that we actually uh, can detect uh, planets in the habitable zones with uh, current radio velocity uh, precisions. And with this cartoon, then I'm uh, uh, showing, comparing the habitable zone, uh, uh, then sort of a cartoon picture of the a planet in the habitable zone around the sun-like star uh, on the left, and then around uh, mid to late M dwarf on the right. And uh, because M doors are intrinsically faint, this uh, then um, causes the habitable zone to be closer in uh, to the host star. And because M doors are relatively low mass, this also increases uh, the uh, radio velocity semi amplitude of a planet orbiting in the habitable zone around the M dwarf, making it detectable uh, with current uh, technologies. Uh, then the RV. Uh, semi-amplitude of the uh, planet around the sun-like star is on the order of 10 centimeters per second, um, but around the mid to late M dwarf, it's on, on the order of a, an order of magnitude larger, or about a one meter per second, which is then uh, detectable with, with current technologies. And um, then uh, the TESS mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Satell Survey Satellite, which uh, I'm sure many of you are intimately uh, familiar with, is uh, currently detecting, um, uh, has already detected over 2,000 exoplanet candidates, most of which are actually uh, then uh, planet candidates orbiting around nearby bright M dwarfs. But uh, TESS is then an all sky uh, then survey to look for transiting planets around the nearest and brightest stars. And because M dwarfs are just so numerous and they're also our nearest neighbors, and because because TESS has particularly good sensitivity to the uh, red optical test is detecting, uh, has detected hundreds of, of uh, exciting planetary candidates around nearby uh, bright M dwarfs that are in great need of, of then high precision follow up capabilities to accurately characterize these uh, exciting uh, systems, uh, both with respect to their, their, their radii and then also to accurately characterize their, their masses. So there is a great need for, for precision, uh, both photometric capabilities from the ground and then also precision radio velocities. And if we uh, do uh, have, uh, if we have a precision uh, capabilities, both to uh, constrain the radii uh, uh, and the masses, then we can put them uh, on an exoplanet mass radius diagram. I'm showing an example of that over here, the lines here and then lines of constant density, 100% water world would land somewhere around this line and a uh, rocky uh, terrestrial world would uh, be land in and around somewhere around uh, this line. And, um, so there's a, because TESS has been detecting so many uh, planets, then there's a great need to uh, then more rapidly uh, uh, then uh, follow them up with high precision capabilities. This will then allow us to uh, then constrain both the y-axis and the uh, x-axis arrow bar on, on this plot. And, um, and many of these systems that TESS is uh, uh, then detecting are gonna be uh, some of the best uh, uh, planets in the future to follow them up with uh, transmission spectroscopy uh, with James Webb in, in, in the future. And that sort of uh, concludes the uh, sort of motivation uh, part of uh, my talk where I hopefully uh, then I'm motivated that uh, M dwarfs are particularly exciting uh, system and planet, planet hosts uh, to, uh, to study and, and detect and characterize new uh, planets. And this is then um, an overview of sort of the next uh, uh, then parts of uh, the talk. Um, in the next few slides, then I wanted to talk about sort of uh, our uh, two pronged approach in, in uh, both then technology development to uh, both achieve precision photometry from the ground with these uh, new technology called engineer diffusers. And then I'll also talk about uh, then our work on the HPF and NUID spectrographs, uh, which are the new next generation spectrographs uh, to um, detect and characterize new uh, terrestrial planets. And then I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about a couple of new uh, papers that we relatively, uh, relatively recently uh, uh, have been working on. So are there any questions about uh, anything at all so far? Um, if not, then um, I will probably just dive right into uh, the engineered diffusers. Okay, then, uh, so let's dive then into engineered diffusers. So first off, then what are engineered uh, diffusers? So I actually have one with me over here, and then maybe uh, 
can show you over here. Hopefully you can see, maybe it might be helpful to pin uh, the video. Uh, but what I want to show you is a uh, uh, then a quick sort of live demonstration of uh, what these diffusers are. Uh, a diffuser is essentially then a nanofabricated piece of optic, usually uh, consisting of a, a um, glass substrate with a thin polymer layer on top. And uh, then it has very uh, intricately engineered uh, then surface structures on the surface of it. Uh, I'm showing one of the uh, a, a surface electron microscopy image of uh, diffuser surface uh, over here on uh, the uh, PowerPoint slide uh, that is on the order of 100 micron or, or so in, in size and shape. And so in uh, with this diffuser sampler, then I actually have then these circles of different uh, then uh, diffuser patterns. And depending on exactly how you um, engineer and shape uh, your uh, the diffusers, you can um, then mold uh, your uh, the incoming beam profile and uh, to a desired output profile. And hopefully, I want to try and see if I can do this over Zoom uh, to show you. Uh, depending on exactly how you uh, design your uh, diffuser pattern, you can uh, create a different uh, PSF uh, output patterns. So, you can turn off the light over here, and then you uh, let's say that this is a telescope beam, uh, and then depending on how you. Uh, um, then shape uh, the diffuser pattern. You can then get a filled uh, circle, unfilled circle, a square. Uh, here's another square, uh, a line, and I think there was a triangle. Yeah, a triangle, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, and this is all then dependent on how you then engineered uh, the diffuser surface structures. And we then uh, worked with a company called uh, RPC Photonics in upstate New York to. Um, help develop a, a, a diffuser for us that uh, resulted in a, a sort of filled top at uh, PSF uh, like this. So let's see. And uh, in doing so, then uh, this then allows us to uh, spread the light out uh, over many pixels uh, on uh, the CCD. And in doing so, this allows us to, to then uh, average over then interpixel sensitivity effects, but the CCDs or the detectors that we're using, they aren't perfect. There are always like some uh, then variations in the sensitivity so, uh, in, in the pixels to the light that is falling in on them. And this also opens the door to uh, then um, in, uh, use uh, then uh, and observe uh, uh, bright stars uh, with big telescopes at very high observing efficiencies. Uh, uh, and those are exactly uh, the, the test uh, stars that uh, we are that we are very interested in, 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 in following them up. And on this slide then, yeah, I just show uh, then how diffusers are made. It's essentially then a, uh, then a glass substrate then and with a thin uh, polymer layer on top. And then uh, you use then a UV laser that sits on a very precise XY stage. And then by modulating the intensity of the laser as you step through uh, the XY uh, coordinates, uh, then you can essentially uh, then write out uh, your diffuser pattern and then you can etch away uh, the differently exposed uh, then uh, photoresist layer. And then you have your, your micro lenslets uh, at the end. And um, th these diffuser patterns can also be directly etched onto a uh, few silica glass. And this actually is particularly useful if you want to uh, then um, observe in the near infrared, because then you can actually cool uh, down the diffuser to cry cryogenic temperatures. And we then worked with uh, RPC Photonics uh, to um, then uh, build a diffuser uh, for the three and a half meter telescope at Apache Point. And I'm showing then the diffuser here on the left. It's about 150 millimeters in diameter or so, and uh, which we installed then on the three and a half meter telescope at uh, Apache Point, and uh, which I'm showing here on the right. And we, this is then a video comparing a, a defocused uh, PSF as a function of time. Uh, then you can see the uh, diffused uh, or defocused, uh, sorry, PSF then uh, moves around. You can see different spikes uh, moving in, uh, in and around in, in the PSF. This is detrimental for uh, precision photometry because ideally you want to uh, always uh, illuminate the same pixels in the same way. Uh, and then here on the right, I'm comparing uh, the diffused uh, PSF, uh, which, um, then returns a, a top at uh, a diffuser PSF uh, that remains stable uh, throughout the night. 
And then, yeah, in, in some of our uh, engineering observations that we did after installing uh, the diffuser, then we observed the bright uh, uh, binary 16 sig, which is a V of 16 uh, binary, I believe, um, bright enough so that you normally wouldn't actually observe it with a three and a half meter telescope with an imager because normally you would just uh, saturate almost instantly. Uh, but with a diffuser, because we can then spread out the light over many pixels, uh, we can um, then really start to make use of all those photons. And uh, this is then what the uh, photometry looks like as we bin in down. And then in 30 minute uh, bins, we are able to obtain about a 62 parts per million uh, precision. And this is then formally below uh, than the 80 uh, parts uh, per million uh, transit depth of Earth around, around the sun. And um, we also chose this target because the Kepler spacecraft observed uh, this uh, same target. And then in a head-to-head uh, uh, -head comparison, then we're within a factor of two or so uh, from Kepler on, on the same, uh, same target. So, and because diffusers are relatively inexpensive uh, devices, uh, then a two by two inch diffuser similar to, to this one is only uh, in and around $500 or, or so. And uh, then we have been working with a number of different groups uh, to install and uh, commission diffusers on different telescopes, like I'm showing on, on this slide, um, um, telescopes then large and small. And we've then been using in particular uh, the diffuser on the three and a half meter telescope at, uh, at Apache Point uh, to uh, follow up with a number of different K2 and uh, test uh, targets to um, then help confirm and, and characterize uh, these exciting planets in, uh, in, 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 uh, at high precision. And diffusers are then also being considered uh, at some other uh, different uh, telescopes uh, as well. So yeah, if you're if you're ever if you're interested in in, in uh, using a diffuser on on uh, your telescope, then uh, definitely let me know. I'm always happy to to help help with that. Uh, so. And then, yeah, that sort of uh, concludes what I wanted to say about uh, the um, engineer diffusers. Uh, are there any questions before we dive into the precision RVs? Okay, no, so then I will, uh, let's then just dive uh, right into the RVs with HPF, I uh, know it, uh, but uh, then like Prabal mentioned, then I'm a uh, part of uh, the instrument science teams for two uh, different uh, spectrographs, the Hubble Zone Planet Finder uh, here on uh, the left, and the um, that we relatively recently installed on the 10 meter Hoppy Ebley telescope in Texas uh, on, on the bottom left, and then uh, the NN Explorer NUID uh, spectrograph uh, on the right uh, that we are actively uh, finishing uh, commissioning on the 3.5 meter telescope at uh, Kitt Peak. And the main science goal of HPF is to carry out, out a, a survey of uh, nearby bright uh, then uh, MDORS, bright then in, in the near infrared to look for then uh, exoplanets in the uh, Hubble zones around these uh, mid to late uh, MDORFs um, uh, within 25 parsecs uh, or so. And the main science goal of NUID is to focus more on detecting and characterizing then uh, these uh, terrestrial planets in and around uh, solar type stars. And the main sort of design of both of the instruments then flows down uh, from these uh, then um, science um, science directions. We have then designed HPF uh, as a near infrared uh, spectrograph, uh, 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 then really making use of uh, all of the uh, near infrared photons then coming from uh, mTORs uh, then. Uh, HPF covers then the information read Z, Y, and J bands from around 810 to 1280 nanometers at a resolution of about 55,000. We then use a Hawaii 2 near infrared uh, detector array, cool everything down with a liquid nitrogen tank down to around 180 Kelvin to minimize thermal background radiation. We do that with uh, this liquid nitrogen tank uh, down over here. And uh, then we have copper straps uh, then uh, attached to uh, the thermal shield over here. And then we have a number of different uh, then uh, thermal control stations uh, all over the thermal shield uh, that uh, are responsible for maintaining uh, the temperature at 180 Kelvin or so at a millikelvin uh, precision long term. And uh, with respect to uh, the uh, NUID, uh, spectrograph NUID uh, actually operates in uh, the optical, uh, then from around 380 to 930 nanometers and, um, and uh, at a resolution of about uh, 100,000 or, or so. Uh, and because we're using then a CCD uh, chip, a nine by nine K CCD uh, chip, then uh, we don't actually have to uh, cool down uh, the instrument um, to, to, do, to do that. 
and uh, we actually operated at a slightly elevated room temperature of around uh, 300 Kelvin or, or so. And, um, and the precision level of uh, HPF is uh, about one um, meter per second that we're uh, hoping to get. And uh, with NUID uh, that we're actively finishing uh, commissioning, then we are uh, uh, then hoping to get around 30 uh, centimeter per second uh, radio velocity uh, precision. So. Uh, because yeah, we have already uh, then uh, installed HPF and we have been observing uh, now for a couple of years or so. And uh, we're currently then carrying out a five year uh, blind uh, survey of uh, 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 using HPF of then mid to late M dwarfs to look for uh, uh, planets in, in the habitable zones uh, around these mid to late M dwarfs. And here I'm showing then a, a, an RV stream of, uh, of uh, then the nearby bright uh, M dwarf star Barnard star, uh, where we're seeing then a precision of around 1.5 uh, meter per second scatter. Uh, in principle, uh, our uh, RV error bar uh, on the uh, different points is on the order of 0.9 uh, meters per second in this data stream. We have actually been continuing to observe it uh, since we published uh, this uh, stream in our paper from 2019. Our current scatter is in and around two meters per second or so, uh, uh, but uh, our uh, information content suggests that we should have a precision of around 0.8 meters per second uh, or so. So we're actively taking a look at uh, if the additional scatter that we're seeing is then due to instrumental effects, uh, due to stellar activity, or or potentially the the uh, the, uh, the the planet that has been reported around uh, this um, um, this star. But we're super excited about this, uh, then these precision levels, and then uh, these are some of the highest uh, precision radio velocities that have been obtained in the near infrared. Um, so we have then been using then HPF uh, and the high precision capabilities of HPF to uh, then carry out, we're currently carrying out uh, the survey uh, and uh, to find planets in the habitable zones around nearby uh, M dwarfs. And here's then a simulation of sort of the expected yield that we ex expect to get. And uh, then this is showing then the minimum mass as a, a function of orbital period uh, for a simulated five-year HPF survey, where we expect to be able to detect then tens uh, of exciting uh, new planets around nearby mid to late uh, M dwarfs, um, where many of them are going to be in the in the habitable zone around uh, uh, these uh, stars. Uh, so this then will allow us to uh, start to answer some very exciting questions about what is sort of the intrinsic uh, frequency uh, of planets around uh, mid to a late M dwarfs, which have remained particularly poorly studied uh, because there haven't been a very high uh, precision radio velocity uh, capabilities uh, in in uh, the, the near infrared uh, for, for uh, um, because most of most instruments have been op op uh, operating in the optical, so yeah. So uh, that was sort of the main things that I wanted to uh, say about the the uh, near infrared uh, RVs with HPF and and uh, and uh, with NUID. Are there any questions on the RVs so far? No, uh, if not, then we can then uh, dive into a couple of uh, new exciting uh, science cases where we've been then using both the then the precision uh, photometry capabilities with uh, diffusers and then also precision RVs with HPF uh, and uh, NUID um, to um, then detect and characterize the new uh, planets with uh, with these uh, precision instruments. So. Um, then yeah, then let's just dive right into uh, um, K25. And so to give you a quick background uh, on uh, the system, K25 is then a, a Neptune-sized, uh, about three and a half uh, Earth radii planet orbiting its M4.5 dwarf uh, host in the uh, Hyades cluster. Uh, and because we know it is in the Hyades cluster, it's then uh, we know its age uh, very well, and then uh, around 700 million years old or so. And uh, we also know its metallicity. And uh, because we know uh, that it is a cluster member, then this allows us to, uh, through isochronos, to uh, characterize the uh, stellar parameters of the, uh, the star um, uh, extremely well, which trickles down to uh, very precise planet parameters as well. Um, so this planet was originally detected in uh, data from the K2 
uh, spacecraft, um, uh, where, which I'm showing here at the top. You can see that there are clear uh, rotational modulations seen here at, at about 1% level uh, or so uh, with a clear periodicity of about 1.9 days. And after we uh, then remove the uh, rotation period variability, then we uh, clearly pick out the 1% deep uh, transits uh, or so, uh, which uh, uh, then um, showing them, yeah, very deep uh, transits of the three and a half uh, Earth radius planet. And um, then to further characterize the, uh, the, the, the planet better, then we were able to obtain a number of different uh, ground-based uh, diffuser-assisted transits of K25. Uh, here I'm showing at the bottom five uh, different transits that we observed with uh, the diffuser on the three and a half meter uh, telescope at Apache point, and then with the Arctic imager. Uh, and then here in the sort of um, middle uh, row over here, then we were able to obtain uh, four different uh, um, ground-based diffuser-assisted transits with a half degree uh, imager on the 0.9 meter telescope at uh, Kitt Peak. And so with these uh, additional transits, we were really able to better uh, uh, resolve the, uh, the shape of the transits and uh, better uh, characterize the orbital uh, parameters of, of, of uh, this exciting uh, planet. And in particular, we were very interested uh, in the original discovery paper. Uh, there were some hints at that the, there might be, uh, that the planet might actually be eccentric uh, due to the, the short, uh, relatively short orbital period of, of the planet. Um, uh, no, not orbital period, relatively uh, short uh, transit duration of, of uh, the transit. Uh, and um, so we are very interested to uh, then get also uh, precision radio velocities with HPF out of transit, both to then uh, constrain the mass of the planet, but then also to uh, see if we could constrain the eccentricity better. And with the, uh, by jointly modeling then the um, the transit data that we had, and then also the precision uh, RVs, then we were able to uh, then um, both constrain then the mass of the planet um, and then also the eccentricity. Uh, this was then the first uh, mass measurement of uh, this uh, exciting planet and only the second uh, uh, planet in a young cluster with a measured mass uh, to date. So we were very excited uh, about that. Um, the mass of K25 is coming out to be slightly more massive than we were sort of expecting, about a factor of two or so. We were maybe, maybe expecting about uh, 12 uh, Earth masses uh, from a sort of planet um, mass radius relations, uh, but the current mass is coming out in at around 25 uh, Earth masses, so it's slightly dense. And interestingly, uh, we're uh, getting an eccentricity of around 0.43 uh, for, for the planet. Um, so which is, uh, which is definitely a moderate eccentricity for the relatively short uh, orbital period, about uh, 3.5 uh, days. And because the uh, planet is particularly, uh, or, or the star is particularly active, and we, you saw in the K2 uh, light curve that the rotation period is around 1.9 days, there are clear uh, signatures of that also in the uh, HPFRBs. And then we had to uh, take an in-depth look uh, and account for uh, rotational modulations with correlated noise uh, models then using Gaussian processes to, to uh, um, then model that in, in our uh, RV modeling. Uh, but we were very excited to be able to uh, pull out the the, the RV signal uh, despite that. So um, this is then where um, K25 uh, lands in a, uh, an exoplanet radius and mass uh, space. So it's landing then over here. This is sort of uh, where uh, most other uh, planets are so with similar um, radii are landing and K25 is then coming out slightly more massive than we sort of would have expected. Um, and uh, if you then run a um, two uh, component composition model of assuming an Earth-like core and uh, enveloped by a hydrogen helium envelope, then we get that K25 is most likely consistent with having then around 5% hydrogen helium envelope uh, by mass. But in reality, there are degeneracies in these uh, composition models uh, with the current uh, mass and radius uh, data in hand, we can't really discern between uh, a model like this and maybe a model that has uh, some component of water and things like that. You can actually see that K25 is actually fairly close to the 100% water world over here, uh, but it's gonna be very interesting to, to to uh, then ob obtain uh, future uh, transmission spectroscopic observations of k 25 b with Hubble or, or James Webb in, in, in the future to, to really see if, if there are signatures of a high mean molecular weight uh, molecules such as water or, or other molecules in, 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 in the atmosphere. 
Um, and then, yeah, one of the questions that uh, then we wanted to try and answer is, uh, is about the relatively moderate eccentricity that we see of K to 25 of then around 0.4, um, then of around 0.4. And then we looked for um, evidence if there was a potentially other uh, planet in the system uh, from the uh, outer transit HPF radio velocities. Uh, in short, we don't really find any clear evidence for another planet in the system. But with the current data in hand, we were then able to place a, a three sigma upper mass limit on uh, the mass of another potential planet in the system. That's then the red line uh, over here as a function of orbital period. But it's, uh, it still remains a possibility that there could be another uh, planet at, at, uh, uh, with smaller masses uh, than lurking in the data. So it's going to be very interesting uh, then as additional data is, is, is um, uh, um, observed of, of uh, this system to see if uh, one could pull out uh, then uh, another, uh, see if there's evidence of another planet in the system. So, but because there uh, are uh, th this evidence of uh, fairly interesting dynamical history uh, in the system, particularly because we do see that uh, it has a fairly moderate eccentricity, we were also very interested in taking a look at uh, the uh, measuring the obliquity uh, of the system. Uh, but it turns out that K25 is one of the best uh, M dwarf stars for uh, uh, Rosser McLaughlin uh, observations to constrain uh, the obliquity of the, the planet. And in this cartoon, then I'm showing what what um, uh, the Rosser and McLaughlin uh, effect observations uh, then try to measure. Uh, but then um, as a star rotates around its uh, rotation axis, it actually causes one hemisphere of the star to be blue shifted and the other hemisphere to be uh, red shifted uh, from the observer. And uh, as a planet uh, transits uh, across the rotating stellar disk, it successively blocks out uh, differently blue and red shifted parts of the, the uh, stellar disk. And uh, this then causes an anomaly in the RVs that we measure uh, during the, the transit. And the shape and amplitude of, of, of this uh, RV curve are directly uh, related to the obliquity angle uh, over here and highly sensitive to it, uh, the obliquity angle lambda uh, over here, which is the angle between the stellar equator and the planet uh, orbit. And then this has been uh, this angle has been uh, uh, the obliquity angle has been shown to be a very great probe for uh, then uh, dynamical formation histories uh, because if we do see that a planet is observed to have a misaligned orbit, the the natural question arises: how how did it ob obtain this this misaligned orbit? Did it form in a in a misaligned uh, primordially misaligned disk, or or was it kicked into uh, this uh, uh, misaligned orbit, uh, or 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 what happened? And with HPF, then we were able to obtain uh, then three uh, different uh, transits of K to 25 uh, in, in, in transits with uh, high resolution spectroscopy with HPF. And here I've actually uh, combined all of them into this movie over here. And then uh, we see that the RV data with HPF then goes up first and then down. And uh, then it uh, goes to the baseline. And this, this is then a telltale signal of a well-aligned uh, system. Our uh, current uh, posteriors on, on Lambda suggest then a Lambda of around three plus minus uh, 16 degrees or so uh, after then uh, combining all of the transits uh, together. And this then um, suggests that K25 is uh, consistent with being well-aligned and confidently rules out any uh, high degree of, of uh, misalignments. So. And then, yeah, if we uh, compare where uh, K25 lands on other, um, if we take a look at where uh, other sky projected obliquity measurements that have been uh, done to date uh, are, then uh, this then shows the uh, lambda angle as a function of effective temperature uh, for different obliquity measurements with the Rosser McLaughlin effect. And then uh, in blue here, I'm uh, comparing uh, or showing uh, measurements for uh, Jupiter uh, sized planets. And uh, then uh, in black, I'm uh, uh, showing uh, points for then Neptune and terrestrial uh, sized planets. And interestingly, I want to highlight uh, this part of the plot, the red sort of shaded region, which is where the M dwarfs are. Currently, only four M dwarf planetary systems have their obliquity measured uh, to date. Uh, this is then again primarily due to the fact that M dwarfs are relatively faint in the optical, where the highest precision rate of loss is has have been operating, uh, but we're very excited to, to uh, continue uh, doing other uh, additional Rosser McLaughlin observations of uh, other M4 planets uh, to, to uh, better probe uh, and uh, understand the obliquity distribution of, of M4 planets. 
Uh, it's also very interesting to compare uh, how KD25, um, the obliquity uh, angles between KD25 and GJ436. Uh, in many ways, both of these planets are very similar. Uh, they have similar uh, uh, overall periods and masses and radii. And both of them are actually uh, observed to be uh, then uh, have eccentric orbits. And, but interestingly, they show different uh, obliquity angles. Uh, so um, this then likely uh, points to then different formation scenarios uh, or formation histories, uh, like we discussed in our paper, uh, potentially uh, KD25 uh, could potentially have formed uh, via a planet planet scattering event uh, er earlier in its, uh, uh, in its uh, formation history, potentially actually even uh, resulting in, in a planet merging event. This would actually uh, help uh, explain why KD25 is relatively dense if it's actually a, a, a a, um, a merger of uh, two um, then sort of mini Neptune planets, and then we might then actually be catching it in the act of um, high eccentricity migration, uh, having been kicked into a high eccentricity orbit, uh, which uh, is then is in the progress of of circularizing uh, its orbit, and that's why we're we're uh, seeing uh, that it has a very sh short uh, orbital period of around three and a half days and planet, planet scattering also generally does not tend to misalign severely misalign orbits uh, and this could then also help uh, then uh, explain the relatively low uh, sky projected obliquity that we see um, for example favoring that over a cosi lease of uh, or lead of cosi uh, uh, um, then mechanism that usually leaves uh, planetary orbits stranded on on uh, misaligned or, or polar orbits so, yeah, any questions about uh, K-25? If not, then uh, we can uh, dive uh, into TY-1266, and um, which is then the last uh, sort of topic of the talk. And uh, so that is an exciting uh, then new two planet uh, M-dwarf system um, where, which we've characterized them both with the diffusers and then also uh, prediction RVs with, with HPF. And this then was observed uh, with tests uh, in actually four sectors that I'm showing uh, over here, uh, sectors 14, 15, 21, and 22, uh, where I'm highlighting the two different uh, transits here in the red uh, triangle and the blue uh, triangle uh, over here. Um, TOA 1266 is then a uh, nearby uh, bright uh, M2 uh, star um, with a distance of about uh, 36 uh, parsecs or so. And in the middle uh, uh, plots over here, I'm then showing the phase folded uh, um, test light curves with a, uh, the inner planet has a period of around 11 days and has a radius of around two and a half Earth radii. And the outer planet has a period of around 19 days and a, a radius of around 1.7. Earth radii. And in the bottom panel, I'm showing then uh, the ground-based transits that we were able to obtain of, of both uh, uh, planets, then really confirming that uh, this star is the true uh, source uh, of, of the, the, the transiting events. And we were very excited to be able to uh, recover a ground-based uh, transit of uh, planet C, uh, especially because the, the, the transit depth is fairly shallow, around one, one and a half millimag or so. And also there are just not so many uh, opportunities in a given uh, uh, semester uh, to catch it uh, due to the relatively uh, uh, long orbital, orbital period. And uh, one of the very interesting things about the system is that the outer planet, uh, um, uh, planet C, uh, uh, resides in the so-called exoplanet radius valley uh, because it has a 1.7 uh, um, Earth radius. Uh, radius. And so what is the exoplanet radius valley? Uh, so in, in a very seminal uh, paper in 2017, uh, Benjamin Fulton and uh, et al. then published a very uh, seminal paper uh, sort of showing um, uh, a very statistically significant uh, dip or valley in the radius distribution of uh, planets from the California Kepler uh, survey uh, sample, uh, which I'm showing uh, over here from their paper, uh, showing then two peaks with a, with a clear uh, valley in, in the radius distribution of, of, uh, of small planets. Uh, this has then been interpreted as sort of the dividing line between rocky super Earths down over here and then gaseous mini Neptunes over here. And interestingly, TOI 1266 <laughs> uh, has a radius right here in, in, in the middle. Uh, so then the natural question is, uh, does uh, 1266C have a uh, radius that is, uh, uh, or ha have a composition that is uh, more consistent with a rocky super Earth, or is it more consistent with being a mini Neptune? And 
Uh, this is then another uh, plot to sort of visualize uh, where uh, where the expected uh, radius uh, value is uh, supposed to be uh, in the sort of planet radius, planet orbital period uh, plane. Uh, but there are sort of three main uh, theoretical frameworks that sort of seek to uh, explain the emergence of the radius valley, which I'm uh, showing over here. Um, in the color points, I'm showing then uh, mTOR planets uh, with uh, cons highly constrained then masses uh, and uh, radii. And uh, in black, uh, I'm showing TOI 1266b and 1266c. And um, I'll walk you then quickly through the, the different uh, then, um, then theoretical frameworks, but they all sort of, uh, they, they differ in sort of how uh, they predict that the exoplanet uh, transition radius, which is then this, um, then the dividing line between the rocky and uh, non-rocky planets uh, should uh, then uh, change as a function of uh, orbital period. Um, and then in the dashed line, then I'm showing then the photo evaporation scenario. This, this idea then revolves around the fact that, uh, or around the idea that um, exoplanet atmospheres are then stripped away uh, due to high energy uh, irradiation uh, coming from uh, the host star. This then predicts that the um, uh, non rocky to rocky transition radius should decrease. Uh, with uh, orbital period. This then makes sense uh, because if a planet um, then orbits closer to its host star, then it's easier uh, to strip away uh, its atmosphere because it uh, is then receiving a higher uh, amounts of irradiation from its host star. And the core part mass loss uh, scenario, then that's essentially then explaining then uh, atmospheric loss due to the residual heat uh, from uh, uh, a con contracting uh, planet that is uh, capable of then shedding away the outer layers of, of the atmosphere of the planet. And that also predicts that the um, uh, rocky to non-rocky transition radius should decrease with orbital period. And then lastly, the gas pore formation scenario uh, here is shown in the uh, thick um, uh, black line. Uh, then, then the idea is that uh, the difference between the the uh, super Earth and the uh, mini Neptune is, is really uh, then primordial. Uh, then the idea is that um, uh, that uh, the super Earths are then formed uh, later in the protoplanetary disk phase, essentially after uh, all of the the gas has dissipated in, in the disk, and so then there just isn't uh, a lot of gas to actually accrete. Uh, so you end up with a rocky uh, planet, but then the mini Neptunes uh, then uh, form earlier in, in uh, the protoplanetary disk phase before the, the gas is dissipated, then uh, resulting in, 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 in a, um, a mini Neptune uh, gaseous planet because there is still gas around. But interestingly, if we consider all of these uh, then uh, models, uh, TOA 1266C is a uh, land smack here where uh, we expect uh, the rocky to non-rocky transition uh, to be. So uh, then the big question is, is 1266 um, uh, rocky or gaseous? Because we have all of these then um, expectations that it should be sort of right at the uh, intersection of all, of all these models. So we were unable to obtain uh, uh, RVs with HPF to uh, constrain uh, the masses of, of both planets. Currently, uh, the uh, number of RVs and the precision that we have on, on this planet is uh, sufficient to validate uh, both planets, which we published in our uh, paper, which is currently in press. Um, we have a formerly uh, around two sigma mass constraint on the inner planet, uh, but only really an upper uh, mass limit on, on the outer planet. Uh, but we're very interested in continuing to follow uh, this system up, uh, both with HPF and the NUID in the future, uh, to constrain uh, the mass of, of, of both planets, and in particular, uh, uh, planet C, to really uh, constrain what is the, the composition of this uh, exciting planet. Um, this, yeah, this then shows the uh, current, just a mass radius diagram uh, of our current one and two sigma uh, radius and mass constraints. Um, the outer planet, no, sorry, the, the inner planet, TOI 1266b, uh, is shown over here, is uh, most li likely consistent with being a mini Neptune with at least a 1% hydrogen helium envelope. But with the current data in hand, we can't really uh, tell between an Earth like composition uh, or a, a hydrogen helium. Uh, envelope uh, system for for the outer planet. So uh, we really need more uh, RVs to 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 really tell. And and then lastly, uh, then one of the also interesting things about uh, this system is that. Um, um, 
uh, TOA-1266 is one of the very few uh, multi-planet amateur systems where the inner planet is substantially larger uh, than the outer planet, which raises a number of different questions of how such systems form. Uh, here on the y-axis, then I'm um, showing the radius of the outer planet. Uh, and on the x-axis, I'm showing the radius of the uh, corresponding inner uh, planet. Uh, the dashed line would be then uh, planets would land where that uh, have them adjacent planets that have the same uh, radii. And uh, on this part of the plot would be uh, uh, planets that have uh, where the outer planet is larger than the inner planet. But uh, TOI 1266 lands over here where the uh, inner planet is actually larger. And um, so this then raises questions about, especially like with respect to photo evaporation, then we usually expect the outer planet to be slightly uh, then larger because they, they receive less irradiation from the, from the host star. And you can also see that generally uh, the, the uh, many planets are actually hugging uh, the, the, the dashed line over here, but many, uh, most of the planetary systems are sort of um, a bit um, on, on the left side of, of this line, whereas TY1266C is, is uh, over here. Um, and actually running the numbers on the photo evaporation predictions, then if, uh, as we get more RVs, and if we do uh, see that uh, the outer planet is rocky, then running the numbers on the photo evaporation predictions, then we would actually have expected uh, then uh, for a planet B to have uh, lost uh, all of its uh, atmosphere uh, uh, as well, uh, because then to have enough uh, then uh, irradiation to strip away uh, the outer planet uh, atmosphere, then it would actually be also sufficient to strip away the uh, planet, uh, the atmosphere of the inner planet. But we do see that the outer planet most likely, uh, or sorry, the inner planet is most likely consistent with being a mini Neptune and having retained the hydrogen helium envelope. So uh, if that is the case, then TOA 1266 would be inconsistent with uh, the uh, predictions of uh, photo evaporation. So it's going to be, this is another reason why it's going to be very interesting to uh, then constrain the mass of, of, of this system. And I'm actually actively working with uh, Sonny Harman at Ames and then Ravi, uh, who's on this call, uh, on uh, sort of uh, uh, taking a deep dive in, uh, look into uh, 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 what are the atmospheric properties of, uh, of the uh, uh, potential atmospheric properties of uh, planet C, uh, where uh, Sonny is leading a paper uh, on that, uh, that uh, you should definitely stay tuned uh, on for uh, some exciting uh, analysis in, in, in that paper. And we're also actively looking into uh, then uh, getting some James Webb time to uh, constrain uh, the uh, potential atmospheric signatures of it in, in, in the future. So yeah, those were sort of uh, the main things that I, I wanted to uh, then talk about in, in my talk. So then I'll just leave my uh, summary slide up and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Gummy. Uh, that was a great talk. And um, if you are interested in asking me a question, uh, go ahead and use the raise hand feature or you can also enter it into the chat. Um, and I'll go ahead and read that out. But uh, it's a lot of really interesting stuff. I already have a question, but I'll give everybody a minute to pop in uh, their questions. Yep, sounds good. All right, so I'll just go ahead and ask mine first then, because I'm, I'm not a patient guy. So let's see. Um, so for K225B, um, I mean, the highest interest in nature is super interesting. And I saw you done, um, obviously done that sensitivity detection for the other planet. Um, yep. Is it visible by tests? Would you be able to, or let's say Kiops in terms of doing follow-ups, have they decided on that? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So I believe, uh, I still have to check, uh, but I believe uh, because it's in the ecliptic, so then in the prime mission, uh, uh, TESS has not observed it, but uh, certainly in when TESS will move uh, uh, to the extended mission and do the, uh, the bracketing of the uh, ecliptic plane, uh, then I'm fairly certain that TESS would probably observe it uh, again. So yeah, that certainly would uh, uh, get uh, even more uh, transits that we can use to uh, better uh, constrain it. And that will also be both useful to get more transits, but then also also just to see where uh, in the face uh, is the uh, then stellar rotation and things like that. And that will certainly be very useful uh, for, uh, especially because the, 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 the planet is, uh, or the system is just so active. So if you want to get additional uh, RV observations, then you could try and time it in sort of around the same time as TESS is observing it. And then you can get like, that will really help in terms of constraining your GP models on the stellar activity and should hopefully be able to then, 
uh, allow to for an even better uh, mass constraint, and then potentially also get insights into if the if you can pull out a uh, potential other uh, signal in 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 the RVs. So, awesome. Yes, uh, so we have two questions here. I'll go ahead and re um, I'll read Avi's first, and then Vlad, you can ask right after that. So uh, Avi asks, "What's the timeline for finishing the MDORF survey?" Oh, so uh, yeah, we started uh, then the uh, SPF GTO survey in 2018. And so normally it is five years. So we are now two years uh, in uh, into the survey and uh, we uh, are already starting to uh, 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 find some uh, exciting uh, signals. And uh, we have a paper in prep on uh, a very exciting uh, planet that uh, I regretfully I didn't uh, get a chance to talk about uh, today, uh, but uh, uh, you should stay tuned for uh, an exciting uh, then uh, planet from the HPF uh, survey coming out uh, soon. We're just about to, to, to submit that paper. So. Cool. Uh, Vlad, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask him? Um, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Thanks for a very interesting talk. So, yeah, I have a, um, a couple of questions. The first one is that you mentioned this young system, a K220, really exciting, um, that um, uh, shows an um, interesting planet. Um, uh, and also, you mentioned TOI 1266. Uh, I just was wondering whether this also a young system uh, the point is that yeah, yeah so uh, let's uh, first can you please answer this one then yeah yeah so uh, ty 1266 is uh, then we most likely think it's uh, we don't have very good uh, constraints on the uh, uh, the age but it's most likely between sort of uh, at least older than two uh, giga years so it's certainly it's certainly older than k25 uh, but probably maybe between two and uh, seven or eight uh, giga years or so so yeah. Uh, yeah, the second is just a comment. Uh, so you mentioned um, those um, expectations from the evaporation model, from mm -hmm. the photo evaporation model. Just yeah. want to mention that um, you know when the planet is pretty close uh, to the star, then and the, and the planet has a magnetic field, then the um, you know interaction of the stellar wind with the magnetic field can mm -hmm. induce geomagnetic currents. Then, then dissipate in the atmosphere and can cause the so-called dual heating that can exceed the photo evaporation uh, 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 rate. So, oh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that suggests that you know, if a planet has a magnetic field, if uh, a magnetosphere is present, then uh, that can create additional um, losses, atmospheric escapes. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that is very uh, cool, uh, 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 cool point, and that certainly uh, there are certainly a number of papers that uh, expect, uh, and there is a lot of excitement in sort of uh, the radio community to try and uh, detect uh, then uh, sort of radio signatures uh, from like star planet interactions, and uh, and yeah, we, uh, that, was, that was a great point on sort of the uh, the connection there to then additional evaporation for for atmospheres and, and things like that. So I'll certainly consider that uh, as well. So. See any other uh, questions? I have one more, but I'll, I'll wait another minute. Just to, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, so um, so for TOI uh, 1266 because of that unusual kind of flip in terms of the relative sizes, mm -hmm. uh, you have a you have a constraint on additional companions, or maybe outward companions. If you're thinking about well, how did you know where some of that mass might have gone? If you expect the outer planet to be larger. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So uh, in our uh, paper, we did try and see if there was any evidence for uh, uh, additional planets in that system as well, uh, because uh, we know that uh, just from uh, the Kepler statistics and things like that, the MDORs generally uh, tend to host quite a few uh, planets. So chances are that there are potentially other uh, planets in the system. Uh, maybe the other ones just might not be uh, transiting. And um, so at least from our uh, search, then we didn't see any uh, uh, evidence of additional transits. We didn't really see any evidence of uh, TTVs uh, either, uh, which would then rule out uh, um, then um, than other planets that sort of relatively close to mean motion resonances. And in the uh, HPF RVs, then we didn't uh, at least uh, see any clear evidence for a massive uh, planet, but uh, certainly we will be actively looking as we get more uh, RVs uh, of it in the future to see if we see any other uh, signatures of, of uh, additional uh, planets, which will be very uh, interesting. And so we're very interested to then following it up with then uh, with both HPF and then uh, NUID and potentially MaroonX uh, also also in the future, which is another uh, uh, then sort of red optical uh, spectrograph. 
So, all right. Um, I think Avi has a question. Go ahead, Avi. Um, yeah. I, so you're speaking somewhat to a NASA audience here. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was wondering about the technology for the diffusers. Um, has that flown in space before? Uh, are you aware of um, space qualified versions of this? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, so there was a, a so I know that Keops, uh, the Keops team was actually considering them uh, and they, they have a paper out, I forget if it was in 2016 or, or something like that, uh, just a few years before they uh, launched where they were sort of actively uh, considering them in the lab and, and, and things like that for to essentially spread out uh, the, um, the PSF and make it uh, stable. And uh, they, uh, at the time, uh, this uh, they concluded that uh, it wasn't uh, then uh, um, really demonstrated uh, well enough uh, for um, then flying in space. Uh, so uh, they were sort of uh, uh, being reserved, I guess, on the sort of technology readiness uh, of of uh, the uh, then engineered diffuser devices. And so they ultimately decided on uh, then going with sort of the the defocused uh, PSF that they have. And uh, but. Uh, I mean, with the diffusers on the ground, they at least have been performing extremely well uh, for us. And um, they've been uh, then allowing us to obtain very high uh, precision capabilities. And um, certainly in space, things are always going to be uh, a lot better with respect to photometric precisions because you never have to deal with all the seeing effects and, and uh, then scintillation effects and things like that. But uh, they, they should be able to then deliver a very uh, stabilized uh, PSF. So. Uh, I can imagine then going, for example, with a fused silica diffuser that's like directly etched onto uh, fused silica glass uh, would be, uh, it, it, you could just look at it as, a, as a one of the pieces of optics in, in, you, in the space flight uh, camera, and it should be very stable uh, up there. And um, certainly we would want to do then, um, then uh, very rigorous uh, tests and, and, and things like that, but uh, I think that would be a very, very cool idea. And uh, I've had some, we've been floating around some ideas if, uh, if it could help um, uh, to put a, uh, then a uh, CubeSat uh, with a diffuser because then it would help uh, uh, because they often have like these uh, relatively high pointing jitters and, and things like that. So then you can just spread out the light over many pixels and average over the pointing jitter. And so that might be one sort of of the one idea for a test, um, test case that is uh, relatively uh, so a lot cheaper uh, to to test and try in, in space. Well, that certainly would be super cool to try. Great, thanks. Yeah, I mean, just following up on obvious thing, that's it. You know, it'd be nice because you're going to get that brightness limit for some of these really interesting targets too. Like you know, the 55 yeah. cankeries of the world, where they're just you know saturating things. So um, yeah. that would be yeah. Put in that app, bro, man. <laughs> yep, yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. Awesome. So any other questions for me? Otherwise, let's thank him again. And if you have any additional questions that you want to ask offsite, um, feel free to uh, send him an email. I can pass that on. I think it should be on the invite as well. Um, and hopefully we can get him here on campus when we eventually are able to do that. So. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you all uh, so much for inviting me. It was uh, uh, super exciting. So, so. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you.